Click here. Hey there, it's Dina. We hope you enjoyed hearing our holiday lineup of Click Here radio shows. We produce them with WNYC. And more than 100 public radio stations across the country will be playing these five shows through mid-February. But here, today, the last in the lineup, a show we call Meet the Hackers. And we hope to have more news about Click Here on your radio in 2024. In the meantime, happy holidays and happy new year. And as always, we're really glad you're listening. Chat GPT, AI machines, satellite, engine ignition, click here, and lift up. There's always been a certain fascination about hackers and cyber criminals. The ones in movies and on TV are billed as these brilliant, antisocial outsiders. Just think of Rami Malek's character in Mr. Robot. The thrill of pawning a system. This is the greatest rush. Got access. But it turns out, hackers and cyber criminals may not be so different from the rest of us after all. They have bosses and salary disputes. And on today's show, we thought we'd introduce you to three real-life hackers. An early dark market entrepreneur. The Russian syndicate. They were willing to buy everything. A kind of accidental recruit. And one of the most infamous who recently made the FBI's most wanted list. The money that the DOJ attributes to me, I have never seen such amount. Meet the hackers, today on Click Here. Stay with us. Today we announce the takedown of the criminal online hacking forum known as Darkcode. It was a crime bazaar for hackers. In 2015, law enforcement officials from 20 different countries came together in a rare show of unity. And they did something that at the time was kind of extraordinary. They dismantled a dark web marketplace. Darkcode, allegedly the most renowned English language malware forum in the world. Malware, botnets, and even credit card information stolen during exploits. Dark code and its users deal in fraud, extortion, and money laundering that is a black market. A malware marketplace is just like it sounds. It's like a local grocery store, except instead of hot dogs and cereal, it sells hacks. And there was a real market for them because in the early days of hacking, you actually needed skills to crack into a server. Hacking kits, the prepackaged off-the-shelf hacking tools we see now, didn't really exist back then. Most of these markets conducted their business in Russian. English speakers on the dark web were out of luck until the creation of Dark Code, which eventually became the go-to place to pick up whatever you needed to commit a whole host of cyber crimes. And while Dark Code seemed to end in a blaze of glory with these dozens of arrests, its beginnings were humble, some might say improbable. And for that, you need to go to Western Kentucky, to the small town of Smithland. It is the only county in the state of Kentucky without a stoplight. This is Ryan Green, one of the founders of Dark Code. We do, however, have a caution light, but there is no actual red, green, yellow stoplights in the entire county. The story of Dark Code's rise and fall is a kind of fable for how cybercrime, and maybe hackers more generally, have evolved. It begins as a kind of boy-meets-computer, boy-loves-computer narrative, and then it gets progressively darker. It's not a story Ryan Green ever expected he'd be in the middle of. So was this just a fun thing in your mind, or was it sort of like a, a little bit like you felt powerful? It was a fun thing, it was a powerful thing, and it was a challenge. It was a challenge until it was over, and then it was on to the next challenge which is how things really spiraled out of control. So why don't you tell me about that? Well, once again, we go back. Ryan Green spent most of his childhood on Cemetery Hill in Smithland. It was an old fort from the Civil War, situated right next to the river. You know, here we are, kids riding dirt bikes in it and playing fake war and doing things like that. You uh, you didn't have cell phones, but back then you didn't really call friends. You kind of just showed up. Everybody knew where everybody lived or where the meat spots were and that kind of thing. Ryan's first job was at his dad's gas station. Just gas pumps, a desk, and a chair. They sold candy bars, too. And he might have had a typical Smithland existence had his grandfather not moved in next door when Ryan was in middle school. We 
got into computers. And so he bought this old computer, it was a Commodore 64. It was a big beige box, eight bits, external floppy drive, ports for two joysticks, and a glowing green screen. I remember learning BASIC, and then I learned QBASIC, and we, we went off down that path. Ryan was the only person he knew in Smithland with a home computer. The only person he knew who thought that computers really mattered at all. You have your naysayers saying, oh, them computers, that's a joke, and that's this. And especially in the area that I was from, because it was so country and backwoods, it was farmers, and it was like, oh, we'll never need a computer. But my grandfather, he was actually an engineer. His grandpa started giving him little computer challenges. He would set goals and say, okay, I want you to be able to do this. And then I would just be obsessed with it until I could do it. And then I'd take a little break. From there, he'd write programs for simple games. He learned to code. And by high school, as report cards started going online instead of coming home on paper, Ryan became more entrepreneurial. So I made a clone website of the school that looked like a portal to be able to log in and look at grades. And I would charge the kids so much money to use my portal to show their parents their grades. You'd make like a fake report card and everything else for them? Yeah, give them all A's or whatever they wanted. Make it realistic. Give them some, some of them just wanted to be realistic and get C's and B's, you know? <laughs> It was the 90s, and all this computer stuff that Ryan had done in secret was just starting to become cool, which of course made him want to do more of it. Like the time Ryan's computer got infected by a virus. It was a computer virus making the rounds at the time called Ice-9, and it was helping crash computers everywhere. Then I was like, okay, well, what is a virus? What is a computer virus that these people keep talking about? What do people gain from this? So then I had all kinds of bells and whistles going off in my head. So instead of trying to get rid of the virus, Ryan kept inviting it in. I am infecting myself with this virus over and over and over. He watches what it did to his computer, all the while taking very careful notes. Like what it's modifying, how it's doing it. So you were like reverse engineering it? I was reverse engineering it. And when it was done, Ryan had managed to create his very own virus, his very own version of Ice-9, a kind of... Ice Ryan. And he began talking to other people who were creating new computer viruses and using them to crack into computers, just like him. Who knew there were just other people like me out there? And, and that's when things really started to turn up. Ryan eventually stumbled into what were essentially the back rooms of the hacking world. He found a channel where he could download music and another that offered first-run movies, things like The Fast and the Furious. And did anybody know you had this sort of secret hacker life? I mean, my parents probably had an idea. Like, my dad thought it was awesome getting the movies and everything. He'd be like, oh, is it, is it downloaded yet? When can we watch it? You know, like, and, you know, I'd always hear from my mom, you better not be doing illegal stuff. I'm like, I think she knew I was doing illegal stuff, but was hoping I wasn't. Ryan was becoming a great hacker among an online community of equals. Your people that really knew what was going on and your skilled people, they all stuck together, per se, and shared code snippets and, and things like that. Which drew Ryan and his fellow coders to one of their most famous projects, something called the Butterfly Bot. They created a giant army of computers infected with a malware known as Mariposa, butterfly in Spanish. It was a whole new protocol that we all worked on. It was unlike any other botnet or any other bot on the internet at this point. And all you really need to know is that the butterfly malware could install itself on an uninfected PC, monitor its activities for passwords, bank credentials, and credit cards, and then whip through a network and adjoining networks like a virus infecting a city. The shady people who rented these bots of zombie computers weren't exactly skilled hackers. They were just budding cyber criminals. So they needed tech support, something like a butterfly bot help desk. We all were like, man, you know, we could expand on this. This is a great idea, this and that. And that was when Dark Code was born. To be clear, Ryan wasn't an outlier. He was catching a wave. He was on the crest of a larger trend. 
I think the market itself started to succumb to the temptation of turning into a shop. Roman Sanikov used to investigate dark markets and cybercrime for the FBI. And he says dark code evolved just like most dark markets do. Initially, it was just a great place to swap code. And then it became something else entirely. So from a place where individuals could just exchange ideas to a place where individuals could actually sell things that could be used for malicious purposes. Sanikov says dark markets allowed customers who didn't know how to code to get into cybercrime just by throwing around piles of cash. Most of them are not going in and breaking into systems. What they're doing is they're buying that access. They're buying those vulnerabilities. They're buying those skeleton keys to that house or to that company. And this is where a lot of them make those first connections. Dark code wasn't an open marketplace. It was pretty security conscious. To meet people like Ryan required a personal introduction, someone to vouch for you. And it had different levels of access. And to get into the inner sanctum with all the great coders, you had to prove yourself. People had to build exploits to prove that they were worthy to join the group. Things like... We've got a DDoS panel. We've got Helios with different exploits put in there. we got a HTTP exploit, auto scan. Those file names Ryan's reading, it's a list that comprised the little beating heart of the dark code marketplace in its infancy. Ryan still has all those files on a computer, even after all these years. We got a sec thread, nightmare, doll works, crime pack, the auto scan with fix. And has the public ever heard them listed like that before? Probably not. Crime pack, doll works, Helios. These are all something called exploit kits, which is essentially like the Swiss army knife of hacking. If you're trying to break into a network, an exploit package gives you options. If one set of coding instructions doesn't work, don't worry, it'll just cycle through the others until it finds the right one to break in. And as time went on, Dark Code's reputation for these high-quality hacking packages started to grow, and its customer base began to change. They weren't just dealing with English-language speakers anymore. International buyers were lining up. They would buy up everything. The Russian syndicate, Chinese syndicate, they were willing to buy everything. And Ryan sold them all this stuff under the code name UID0. UID0. Um, that was my dark code name. That was the name that I was using up until the end. But Ryan said he felt all of this was getting too dark. The people he was working with were getting kind of obsessed, getting super focused on money and how much they could make. Back then, you might make about 10 grand a week, something like that. Some days you might make less, some days you might make more. Depends on how you want to scale it. Part of the issue was hacking into systems was getting harder. People were being more careful with their servers, and antivirus software was getting better. So the easy money was drying up, and to make more money, you had to innovate. One of the partners wanted to do more of the stuff that I didn't really want to get involved in. Stuff like credit card fraud and malware spyware and things that felt downright dangerous. There was plans on there how to make remote detonated bombs and everything of the sorts and weird discussions. When we come back, Dark Code takes a dangerous turn, and Ryan tries to find his way out of the darkness. This is Click Here. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Dina Temple Raston, and this is Click Here. Today, we meet the hackers, a rare opportunity to hear three members of the cybercriminal world tell us what they think. And we'll talk to the people who helped bring them down. Before the break, we met Ryan Green, a Kentucky computer whiz who had channeled his energy into something unexpected, a thriving dark web marketplace. And looking back on it, maybe he should have anticipated that it was going to go into much darker places than he'd ever expected. But when he dreamed up the dark code marketplace, he saw it as a way to hang out with other talented hackers. They'd get some free first-run movies, swap some code, exchange ideas. But then it got destructive. It started with people posting instructions on how to make bombs, followed by a roster of stolen credit card numbers. And all this made Ryan feel pretty uncomfortable. So uncomfortable, he decided he was done. Fortunately, he had already started to diversify a bit. 
I still have the marketing company and some other companies as well. But um, most of my time is spent at the plumbing company. So Ryan figured he'd just leave Dark Code and start concentrating on this new life he was building. Unfortunately, the dark web wasn't done with him yet. A little more than a year before that big dark code takedown we talked about before, Ryan Green got a call from the county attorney in Smithland, and he asked him to come to the courthouse. And as I'm walking down through there, I get about halfway through, and I see, like, this group of guys in front of me, like, come out of nowhere, and then I kind of turn around, and there's a group of guys behind me, and they start, like, closing in. One of the men flashed a badge. And he introduced himself as Special Agent FBI, and that he had a warrant, and that at that moment, they were also searching my house. And at that point, I was just like, holy shit. The agents took him into a room and grilled him for hours. They wanted passwords, all his computers, all his cell phones. Smithland Sheriff sat through the whole thing, just shaking his head. He was just mind blown at this point, like just completely. He's known me my whole life. And, you know, he says, he, I remember him saying, if I would have known all this, that you could do all this, I would have had you working right here for us. Ryan Green eventually pleaded guilty to a charge related to spam, and he got two years probation and mandatory computer monitoring. He didn't serve any jail time. The principal reason Ryan Green didn't go to jail was he cooperated. That's David Hickton. He was the U.S. attorney in charge of the dark code investigation, and you heard him at the top of the show. He was the one talking in the press conference announcing the takedown. His lawyer recited a series of virtues like he was a good husband and a good father and hard worker, and our team agreed with that. So instead of throwing the book at him, the prosecution and the judge decided to give Ryan another chance. In addition to that probation, he got a very specific kind of community service. Which involved working with young people to teach them about what's right and what's wrong once you develop computer skills. And that might well have been the end of it, but for one thing. Dark code didn't die. Come out, come out wherever you are. Like in that scene in Cape Fear when Robert De Niro just keeps coming back, Dark code did too. It returned to something called Dark Code Reborn. All new administrators, none of the people Ryan had worked with, but the new forum was using the same name. And here's the thing typically, these newly rebooted sites don't do so well. Potential customers are worried the old sites are just law enforcement honeypots or exit scams, which are essentially an occasion for someone to play on the brand, take your money, and then just disappear. Which is probably why Dark Code Reborn's mission statement went further than dark web markets typically go. It promised to have consumer empathy and provide a good user experience. And that was enough to allow Dark Code Reborn to pick up where the original Dark Code had left off. It was thriving. I mean, how big is it? How much money is traveling through there? I mean, do we have any idea? I don't have specific figures, but I would say it's in the millions. That's Roman Sanikov again. He investigated dark markets and cybercrime for the FBI. And he says Dark Code Reborn was the real deal. It matured. It was more than just the hacker collective it had originally been. It became a thriving marketplace where you could buy anything from narcotics to malware to stolen credit card information. If you have that combination where a shop has existed for over a year and a half uh, and has had, you know, probably millions of dollars go through that shop, to me, that says that this is most likely uh, a legitimate criminal dark web shop. So these dark web marketplaces have found a place in the cyber criminal ecosystem. They're the malicious code supermarket where new hackers can get their start, which means even though dark code is behind him, Ryan Green and the people who started it may have a lot to answer for. Do you feel like you help contribute to what we're dealing with now in terms of ransomware and malware? Unfortunately, yes. And I live with that every day. I actually just had this discussion. You know, I have to live with knowing that stuff that I pioneer affects millions of people on a daily basis. And I, I'm a little naive 
for not looking at all angles of it. And, and I kind of had the mentality of, well, it's, it's kind of like a gun or a hammer. Even some people might take a hammer and build a house. Some people might take a hammer and hit someone in the head, but it is a very common thought that I have It is about how many people on mass scale that I've been responsible in some way for being hurt. And now, with all this well behind him, Ryan has turned to something that ironically feels a little less messy. Plumbing was my original passion. I was a plumber throughout the entire time that I was a hacker, but I find peace in plumbing. So do you think you identify more as a plumber or a hacker? Oh, definitely an ex-hacker. Since then, Ryan has found a way to take his old job and make his new job better. I have wrote my own software, and I literally have figured out how to reverse engineer all the other plumbing companies' uh, estimating numbers that they use on their software. He designed an algorithm so that the company he works for can figure out how much his competitors will bid on any given project. So I can make sure I come in below them. So we have grown the company tenfold in the last two years from three plumbers basically to about 30 plumbers in two years' time. The only difference is that this time, the code Ryan wrote is legal. It's a new chapter for an ex-hacker. Today, we meet the hackers, and sometimes these guys, and they are mostly guys, sort of stumble their way into the dark world of cybercrime, like Ryan, the hacker in Kentucky, did. And sometimes they get there by way of a kind of perceived necessity, an emergency that drives them to do something they've never considered doing. And that's what our next story is about, a young Russian who became infamous in hacker circles but started out as something completely different, a graphic designer. Is this your first podcast? The, the. Yes, yes. This is someone we're calling Ivan Basterlord. He's Russian, and we're speaking with him through an interpreter. He asked us to call him Ivan for reasons that will become clear in a moment. A few years ago, he got mixed up with some of the world's top cyber criminal gangs. Um, so let me just try and understand. Do do you see yourself as a hacker? How do we describe you? Um, Let's put it this way. An extortionist, retired. (laughs) Retired extortionist, okay. We got in touch with Ivan through a researcher who had been talking to him in encrypted channels for months, and Ivan talked to us through the same channels. And because we know it's pretty unusual to get someone like this on tape, we didn't take anything he told us at face value. Everything in the story has been verified with experts in the cybersecurity and law enforcement communities, and many of them track him for a living. And to hear Ivan tell it, he can trace his career as a master extortionist back to a single day in 2019. He was living in the Russian-occupied Donbass region in Luhansk, and fighting was all around him. Uh, The Ukrainian jet fighters were flying overhead to bomb the neighboring town. Uh, And one night, there was powerful shelling. Ivan's mother had chronic kidney stones at the time. And that day, in the middle of a barrage of shelling, she started to experience incredible pain. And nobody could actually come to the rescue. There was no 911, no ambulance service, so Ivan had to beg a neighbor to help him get his mother to the doctor. And they said, help get us to the hospital, I will give you aid. The neighbor agreed, and the immediate crisis was averted. But for one thing. Had no money at that time. Where was he going to get the money to pay for his mother's medical bills? He wasn't making much money working as a graphic designer, And clearly, he wasn't going to get a job in any sort of traditional way, given that the war was all around him. But he did have one other skill, one he hadn't really been using. Since childhood, I took interest in hacking. I was always curious, uh, showing interest to the various forums and various breaking in, but I never used them. I returned home and I went to forum. A dark web forum where hackers hang out. 
and I wrote my first ad. And in that ad, I highlighted that I need money and I'm not afraid of work in any country of the world. So one man approached me through this. As it turned out, his nickname ended up being National Hazard Agency. National Hazard Agency. This hacker told Ivan that he had a job opening. He was looking for a spammer, someone who would send unwanted messages in bulk to a wide variety of people in order to spread malware or trick victims into divulging personal information. Some extortion might be involved as well, he added. And if Ivan would do this, the man told him, he'd pay him $300 a month. This was just enough money to cover the expenses, or at least for a time being. Later, Ivan would learn that the man who responded to his ad asking for work wasn't a random hacker. This man happened to be almost one of the Revel founders. Revel, or R. Evil, which happened to be one of the most damaging cybercrime syndicates in the world. And Ivan started hacking under the screen name Bastarlord. And since 2019, I worked for Revel. I was invited to Lodbit. At the same time, I was working for Abaddon. Plus, I also worked for RansomX. These are all major names in the ransomware world. And it turns out that Bastardlord had a bit of a gift. He knew just what to write in an email to get someone to click on it. And then he developed a specialty that was very much in demand. No, I would actually describe myself as searcher for access or access broker. Access broker. It's a short title for a very complicated thing that has helped fuel this golden age of ransomware we seem to be in. Simply put, to hold the network ransom, you have to get access first. So access brokers are at the top of the hacker food chain. Here's John DiMaggio, a security strategist at a company called Analyst One. There's a whole other larger part of that population that you don't read about every day that don't necessarily have the ability to successfully and easily compromise, you know, a Fortune 500 company or a company that's going to have a lot of money to pay. So, John said, cyber criminals turn to people like Bastardlord. One of the ways to get around that is just buying the access. In other words, he does the breaking in and then holds the door open for customers so they can do what they will once they're inside. But Bastardlord didn't just want to do this all himself. He got an urge to, I guess you could say, give back, which is what made him the talk of dark web forums. He put together a two-volume manual that could teach just about anyone to launch a ransomware attack. No prior experience required. I already knew he had trained people, and from seeing conversations that he's been in and, and people talking about their account of working with him, and one of the things that was seemed really interesting to me was that he seemed to sort of enjoy giving back to that community because someone once helped him, and he wanted to sort of return that favor and help upcoming criminals. He never forgot that one of the founders of Revil had helped him out. John says... It seems like he wanted to create a community of young hackers that he had helped nurture and bring along. The creation of Emmanuel was a tangible way of doing that. Think of it as one man's underground version of one of those old Coding for Dummies workbooks. But instead of putting a CD-ROM in your computer and working on some hypothetical exercises, you get to try the real thing. And when he put the first ransom manual out there, you know, that was how he was making money. He was giving the manual and tools away for free, but, but the free manual only told you how to launch an attack. It didn't teach you how to get access to the systems you wanted to target. But not to worry, for a small additional fee, Bastardlord would provide access to a network he'd already broken into. The administrator for Lockbit, that ransomware gang Bastardlord used to work for, summed up the manual in one word. Brilliant. The manual had such professional art. It wasn't like it was just drawings. They were, you know, in color. This was somebody's baby. What can I compare it to? Okay, honestly, a, a professional comic book. That's what, it, that's what it reminded me of. Bastard Lord put out a second volume more than a year later, in December of 2022. But it didn't occur to him that making hacking easy would start getting him the wrong kind of attention. Attention from people like this guy, Juan Ignacio Nicolosi. So are you kind of hanging around in dark web forums all the time? 24-7. <laughs> that is a lot of time. 
Juan is an investigator at ProDaft, a Swiss cyber threat intelligence company. And he doesn't just follow various hackers. He hunts them. Let's put it this way. We're not afraid of the malware. We're afraid of the creativity and the intelligence of the human being behind it. And there were things about Bastard Lord that intrigued him. Bastard Lord uh, behaves as a criminal, but also we can see a professional behind the scenes. Bastard Lord didn't seem to be driven by ego or ideology. He was actually kind of businesslike, hacking to make a buck. And the manual seemed like just a way to further his brand. But maybe it worked too well, because Juan and his team started focusing on him. And they started by getting a copy of his manual. And when we asked how they did that, they wouldn't say. Though it was pretty clear, they hacked the hacker. We gave visibility to a server. We didn't buy it. We don't give money to criminals. Right. Okay. Well, that makes sense. So is it right to characterize this as sort of hacking back? You broke into their server? Mm, we gave visibility. What does that mean? <laughs> it means we gain visibility that we're able to look inside. This was, of course, a huge blow to Bastard Lord's business. But then he started to worry about something even worse. He feared ProDaf would also reveal his identity, which might get him arrested. So he announced his retirement and said he was leaving the world of cybercrime. Um, I'm not fully so. My psychological condition substantially deteriorated. And it wasn't just the dust-up with ProDaft. Out of the blue, Bastard Lord got a call from the FSB, Russia's intelligence arm. From high-ranking FSB official who requested that I showed for interrogation. That, to some extent, caused some panic in me. As it turned out, the call had nothing to do with hacking, but it rattled him nonetheless. You know, my nervous stress was like at the capacity. He decided to quit while he was ahead. So it was piling up as a snowball, and at that point I was actually being treated uh, by medical remedies from panic attacks. So in order to successfully complete this, I needed to wrap this whole thing up. He said he has enough money now to care for his whole family. We don't drive Ferrari, as many people think, and we don't buy expensive things. So he said he didn't need to be on the cyber front lines anymore. So if you're trying to explain to people why you did all this, how do you explain it? I'm from a poor family, and that was a great opportunity to earn some money. It was just a financial opportunity. There's nothing else behind it. Do you feel guilty about it? Mm, no, not really. For the companies that were paying me enough money to cover their expenses, what, what I'm making is just pennies for them. So because it was companies and not people, you think it's it's not as bad? I think more yes than no. I think this company has enough money to pay all the expenses. And I think people who work for them do not really suffer a lot. He said his mother has her own place in an apartment block next to his now. And he's building a house in Russia. When I asked him where he would be five years from now, whether he'd have a family and a regular job, he said he'd have all those things. I have other hobbies, but I'm not going to divulge them since I can de-anonymize myself. The thing about Bastard Lord's retirement is that no one we talk to in the cybersecurity world actually believes him. No one thinks Bastard Lord is going to retire to a dasha in Russia and work on his hobbies. Hackers don't do that. Though I asked John DiMaggio from Analyst One whether Bastard Lord might be a different breed of a hacker, maybe kinder or gentler. That's an interesting question. I don't know if I would use the words kinder or gentler, but more relatable. If I was to have met Bastard Lord in different conditions, let's say at a bar, I could have a drink and talk to him, and he seems like a regular, personable type of guy. But he's a hacker. What he does affects real people, their lives, their businesses, their retirements, even their ability to put food on the table. I do 100% know that he knows the difference between right and wrong, but he has chosen to keep doing it. 
When we come back, a new addition to the FBI's most wanted list. This is Click Here. I'm Dina Templerest, and this is Click Here. And today, we're doing something a little unusual. We're meeting the hackers, so you can hear them in their own words explain what they do and why they do it. We're trying to give those hoodies behind a computer screen a more human shape. And if that takedown of the dark code market we talked about before was an early indication of how law enforcement is wrestling with the problem of cybercrime, this next story shows how some old-style tools can be wielded in newfangled ways. In the pantheon of outlaws, there's probably nothing quite as legendary as the FBI's most wanted list. Back in the old days, it included gangsters like Al Capone, or bank robbers like John Dillinger, even Bonnie and Clyde, the murderous lovers who went on a three-year crime spree in the 1930s before they were eventually gunned down in their car by law enforcement. Here is Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker, who died as they lived, by the gun. To get that most wanted public enemy number one designation, the person needed to be a danger to society. And the FBI had to make a calculation. Whether all the publicity that comes with the FBI's most wanted will help the Bureau bring them to justice. What may be less known is that the FBI has a bunch of different kinds of most wanted lists. There's one for fugitives, one for kidnappers, and for about the past 10 years, there's been one for the world's most wanted hackers, people who have wreaked havoc from behind a keyboard. The actors named in this indictment were members of a hacking group operated in China. Involved hacking into computers of hospitals, municipalities, public institutions, and businesses in the United States. The criteria to be included is pretty straightforward. It depends on the seriousness of the hacking crimes, the kinds of attacks they've committed in the past, and whether they continue to pose a serious threat. And the people on the FBI's Cyber Most Wanted seem to fall into a couple of categories. Iranian hackers with first names like Amir and Ahmad, North Koreans with last names like Park and Kim, and Chinese hackers, many of whom appear to be in military uniform. And the newest inductee? He's Russian. His first name is Misha. But he's better known by his screen names, Waza Waka or Boris Elson or M1X. And he was put on the list in the spring of 2023. We are following new developments this morning and an apparent hack affecting D.C. police's computer network. Health care providers, school systems, all targets of a Russian national. Who- the Justice Department is putting a bounty on his head to the tune of $10 million. He worked with some of the most notorious cyber criminals in the world. And the Department of Justice claims some of the hacking groups he's worked with have managed to rake in hundreds of millions of dollars from its ransomware attacks. Ransomware attacks happen when cyber criminal groups break into a computer network, steal data, and then hold it hostage or threaten to release it publicly unless a ransom is paid. And you'd be forgiven for thinking that someone like that would have tight operational security. But that's not Misha. This is one of Misha's many social media posts. And all you need to know is that he's on camera and being a bit of a blowhard. He tends to brag about his hacks and even interacts with the researchers who are tracking him. We got his email, and after a little back and forth, he agreed to talk to us shortly after he was placed on the FBI's most wanted list. We interviewed him through his private Telegram account. And you might be able to hear that the Russian voice responding to our questions sounds like the one in his social media posts. I just want to say this. The money that the DOJ attributes to me, I have never seen such amounts. I don't have this money. Where did they get those numbers from? I am interested. Misha isn't sure how the FBI has characterized him, But it does seem clear that he made the cut based largely on the people he hangs out with. He's been an affiliate, which is a kind of contractor, to three infamous ransomware hacking crews, namely Lockbit, Babook, and Hive. Though when we asked him about them, he started out by not wanting to talk about it. I have discussed this many times, and there is no reason to repeat it. 
But then he went on to discuss them at great length. He says a lot of people have accused him of running some of these ransomware gangs, but actually, that's not right. He says he just works with them. Journalists exaggerate more than make mistakes. But there are mistakes. For example, Hive and Lockbit. They made me look like a co-owner of this. Hive and Lockbit, two major ransomware gangs. Misha denies he's a co-owner, but that doesn't make him any less dangerous. He may not be running the operation, but he's only too happy to lend a hand to those who do, whether they're hacking a children's hospital one day or a small working-class town in the U.S. the next. Just ask Prospect Park, New Jersey. It's a small town. We're about just under like a square mile. This is Walter Richmond. He's the officer in charge of Prospect Park. We border the city of Patterson, which is one of the major cities in New Jersey. Many of our streets we share with Patterson. Half of those street will be ours. Half of it will be uh, city of Patterson's. And this little town back in the summer of 2020 was attacked by the Lockbit Gang, a crew Misha had worked with. Walter was one of the first to realize that they'd been hacked. I came in in the morning and our police clerk had alerted us that she couldn't access any of the files. She was trying to scan and do her, you know, her clerical duties. So he went over to her computer and his heart sank. And I noticed that all of our files on our server were of the Lockbit variant. They were changed. So we obviously have Word documents, usually your normal PDF-style documents, Excel, things like that, et cetera. But they were all Lockbit as the file type. So like the extension on the file, instead of saying TXT or, or whatever it was, it would say Lockbit? Yes. So the extension of the files were all changed to Lockbit. Walter called the company that was running the city's IT operations and asked what he should do. And he immediately said, you know, do not log into any computers, tell everyone to not touch any other, you know, desktops or laptops, the vehicles, the police cars. But here's the strange thing. Walter said there was no ransom note. You know, no one reached out requesting a ransom or any, you know, the usual type of, uh, you know, activity. Attacks like these can be terrifying. A city like Prospect Park wouldn't expect to be a target of someone as notorious as Misha. But in an indictment released the day Misha became a cyber most wanted, the Justice Department claimed that he played a role in the Prospect Park attack. They said he was part of a conspiracy to lock up their computers. Why do you think he went after you guys? I'm not sure. It's, that's a really good question. Cybersecurity experts will tell you that hackers are targeting places like Prospect Park because they're low-hanging fruit. Cities typically don't have lots of money to spend on IT security teams. Misha, for his part, told us he wasn't involved. It was not me. It was other people. I just uploaded the data because I thought I needed to upload it. The information was available, he said, so he just grabbed it to prove that they really had the data. You see, a lot of Western cybersecurity companies think a lot of ransomware groups lie. I uploaded the data to prove that it really had been stolen and it wasn't a hoax. While the Prospect Park attack was relatively small ball, Misha's work with all these groups has authorities worried that he'll eventually be involved in something even more destructive, a ransomware attack that actually stops the city in its tracks. Some version of what happened to Dallas this past May. More fallout tonight from a ransomware attack on the city of Dallas. The cyber attack has now closed the municipal courts building and renewed concerns about the possible leak of city employees' personal data. The group that locked up the Dallas city system was a ransomware crew called Royal. They stole more than a terabyte of data and locked up Dallas's computer systems, which had real-world consequences. For weeks, there were no court hearings, no trials, and no jury duty. The concern is that attacks with this kind of impact will become the norm, which helps explain why the FBI is pulling out all the stops in its hunt for Misha and others like him. But here's the crazy thing. We found someone who was able to locate Misha, and even identify him, and has been interacting with him for years now, Azim Kojibayev. He's a senior analyst at a threat intelligence firm called Cisco Talos, and he started tracking Misha a few years ago. So one of my research skills is to really deep dive 
into the human presence on the internet for individuals. And it turns out Misha had inadvertently left little digital footprints on the web, things he'd probably forgotten about, and Azim discovered them. Um, they made a small mistake in posting their both username and name in a very random forum post a very long time ago. Azim put that little piece of information together with other things he'd found. And then ultimately that same name uh, was uh, matched to a resume that indicated and matched a lot of this person's activities. So when Misha reached out to him, Azim responded by saying he knew who he was. He did not deny it. Um, His response was actually uh, very jovial, inquisitive as to how I found out. But because of that, it was, uh, in my experience, one of the biggest icebreakers I've ever had. Actually, your relationship with him was sort of born out of um, begrudged mutual respect? Uh, Yes, and uh, it continues to be that way, it seems. Um, He has recently uh, has gone from a very negative attitude towards me to being uh, somewhat uh, cordial and even nice at times, uh, complimenting me one way or the other which uh, I found that personally to be a little weird. Our producer on our team spent weeks chasing Misha, and he eventually convinced him to talk to us just a few days after he was added to the FBI's most wanted hacker list. And Misha seemed to be taking his new notoriety in stride. I was not surprised. I understood it was going to happen. We worked out a system with him where we'd text him questions in Russian, and then he'd respond to us with voice memos. And we didn't exactly have his full attention. It sounded like he was running errands while he was talking to us. Like at one point, we could hear Rihanna music playing in the background. At another moment, we could hear motorcycles rumbling past, like he was on the street walking home. And that's the weird thing about Misha. While he's being hunted by the FBI, he seems to spend a lot of time doing things that make it pretty easy to find him. Like sending us those voice memos or posting drunk videos on social media. Which, in addition to giving clues about where he is, shows law enforcement exactly what he looks like. In fact, one of his pictures on the most wanted list is pulled from one of those videos. Misha kind of looks like he sounds. Oh, sh- man. My workflow. He looks straight out of Hacker Central casting, like one of those guys in the bar who makes you instinctively move a couple of stools away just so you can avoid any drunken interaction. And he's always calling out cybersecurity analysts on social media, goading them. My workflow. In this clip, he's boasting about all the things they'd learn if only they could get their hands on his laptop which he drunkenly hits with his hand. And all data security professionals in the USA, would you like to see something outstanding and more interesting that you have ever seen before? That's my working laptop. Misha doesn't seem to worry that the FBI might be taking those videos or our voice memos and piecing them together to try to locate him. Are those the kinds of clues that you look for? To answer your question, I do look for those kinds of clues all the time. This is Azim from Cisco Talis again. He shares a lot of those kind of clues one way or the other. I don't particularly think he cares. He's been pretty open, for example, about where he's been living. In recent videos, I think even within the last year and a half, he has claimed to be residing or traveling to the Russian enclave of Kaliningrad, which is surrounded by Poland and Latvia. Which actually isn't as much of a help for the FBI as it sounds. Russia doesn't hand over its cyber criminals. It's actually thought to encourage their overseas hacks. Which may be why Misha doesn't seem to care that he's dropping all these clues. He's given no signs of slowing down now that he's on the FBI's most wanted. In fact, he says he's cooking up some new plans. I want to show that IT in Russia is still alive and well. You don't need to go to the United States to make money. 
you don't need to go to the United States to study. I want to take Russian information technologies to the next level. Misha says he wants to help teach Russia's youth about cybersecurity to protect them from the prying eyes of the CIA and the FBI. I also have this idea of organizing a project to teach children cyber hygiene, to protect them from attacks of all sorts from CIA, FBI, who recruit our citizens. This is open information, they are talking about it themselves. No one does that in our country. You're coming after me, he seems to say to the FBI. I'm coming after you. Click Here is a production of Recorded Future News. Dina Temple Raston is our host and the managing editor of the show. Sean Powers, Will Jarvis, and me, Jade Abdul Malik, produce it. Karen Duffett and Lou Olkowski are our editors, and Lucas Riley is our staff writer. Darren Ancrum does our fact checking, and Ben Levingston wrote the theme music and other original music you heard. We also use music from Blue Dot Sessions. And finally, John Delore is our sound engineer. That's it for this week. We'll be back on Tuesday. From all of us, we hope you have a great new year. <laughs>